We are in the group uh, with uh, Luca, Guy, John, uh, Evan. We are the group three. And look here for the details to, to say this is the first part. <laughs> Dolby's business strategy, uh, I will present it. The second part uh, will be presented by Evan. It's about the relevant IP rights. And uh, for the third part, we were very generous. So we will uh, talk about two uh, companies with similar IP strategy. And this will be presented by John, Luca, and uh, by the third one, Gay. So the first question was, uh, what was Dolby's business strategy to stay successful in the more uh, complex consumer electronics market of the 1980s? And which IP strategy did it use for it? So here you can see uh, Ray Dolby, which is the American engineer and inventor of the noise reduction system known as Dolby NR. He helped develop the videotape recorder while at Ampex and was the founder of Dolby Laboratories. And he is dead since uh, 10 years ago. Uh, first of all, so, uh, the first group presented very well uh, for the 70s and all the IP strategy and the introduction about uh, uh, Dolby, so I will not repeat all of this information. Just to tell you that Dolby changed its intellectual property IP strategy to better suit the changing market dynamics in the uh, uh, 1980s in order to maintain its competitive advantage. Uh, and in order to answer the demand of the uh, consumer electronics markets. So uh, the original licensing structure created by Dolby and presented by John and Marlo was no longer appropriate because the market had become more divided between component manufacturers from a part and the system integrators from the other part. So to combat this, Dolby created a bifurcated IB licensing strategy that allowed them to license their technology in a beneficial, a good way to both component manufacturers and system integrators. So, uh, so this plan involved obtaining two licenses, which are the implementation one. The implementation license, what is this? So Dolby gave uh, the implementation licensees like chip manufacturers a specific set of rights to use in the creation of components that incorporated Dolby technology. Implementation licenses were not required to pay Dolby royalties, but were limited to selling Dolby enabled components to Dolby system licenses. The other kind is the system license so here, Dolby granted system licenses or the systems integrators who used those components in their products a different set of rights. So system licenses were permitted to sell the product for a royalty paid to Dolby after working with Dolby to test and improve the product. What was the benefits of uh, this strategy? This made Dolby technology adoption simple for both implementation and system licenses, as the former had direct access to Dolby knowledge, and the latter did not need to deal with the technical difficulties of component design. This improved <laughs> Dolby's ability to control the implementation's quality, and it allowed Dolby to ensure that all market participants, including system licenses, had an equal chance to uh, compete and it enhanced the efficiency of the commercial ecosystem. So to finish, Dolby was able to sustain its success and maintain its position as a leader in the industry by adjusting its IP strategy to the shifting demands of the consumer electronic markets. And now with Ivan to present that second part. Thank you, Sartan. So the next question was to identify relevant IP rights which support the identified IP strategy of Dolby in the past and today. Um, and so on the next few slides, we will first have a quick look at the different types of IP rights, but also at some of the IP related strategies. 
uh, before moving on to a few real life examples of IP rights that we've been able to find and not quite as elaborate as the very nice overview that Thorsten uh, presented. Um, and also a bit more the focus on the, the present day uh, examples that we came across. Um, and so we came up with these six uh, pillars in total, a three on this slide, three on the next one. And in this first pillar, we have a listing of the different IP rights starting, uh, of course, with the uh, patents. And Dolby has a very extensive patent portfolio of over 3,000 patents and patent applications mm -hmm. worldwide, covering a very wide range of technologies, including audio processing, uh, video processing, and imaging. Um, then there's also design registrations and uh, trade dress. I uh, believe trade dress was already touched upon. So that's a bit the, uh, the impression you get, uh, for example, in the uh, Dolby Cinema environment, uh, a bit comparable to the Apple Store. So what is the, uh, the general um, user experience when you walk into the, uh, to the cinema? Um, next. Dolby also has an extensive uh, trademark portfolio, which covers, for example, its branded sound tech in TVs, Blu-ray players, uh, mobile phones, and so forth. And then finally, Dolby also relies on copyrights and trade secrets, as will become clear a bit further on in this presentation. Now turning to the adopted uh, strategy, the second pillar uh, shows Dolby is licensing technology and know-how to a wide range of partners and licensees, including consumer electronic manufacturers, content creators, and service providers. For example, uh, Dolby Atmos is licensed to movie theaters, home theater equipment manufacturers, and streaming services. Then on the third pillar, uh, we see that Dolby's IP is integrated and coordinated to support its diverse range of businesses. For example, uh, Dolby's patents cover a range of technologies that are used in its consumer electronics products, as well as in the professional cinema and broadcast industry. And then we move to the next uh, slide. Um, so it's also safe to say Dolby develops creative IP strategies to support its atypical constellation of business models. For example, Dolby has developed a licensing program for its Dolby Vision HDR technology, which allows content creators and service providers to use technology to create and distribute high quality HDR content. Uh, Dolby is focused on capturing value from ex its uh, existing innovations. For example, they've developed a licensing program for its Dolby Atmos technology, which allows content creators and service providers to use the technology to create and distribute immersive audio content. And then finally, Dolby is flexible in aligning its IP strategy with the changing needs of its businesses. For example, it's uh, adapted its IP strategy to support its expansion into new markets, such as mobile, telephony, and entertainment. Then we uh, come to some examples. And of course, we already saw the, the, the great examples uh, from group one. Um, just a few uh, on, the, on the top, you see, for example, this uh, system which takes into account the, the, the shape of a room, a patent relating to how uh, noise can be reflected on surface, surfaces like walls and the ceiling. Um, and building some intelligence to, to, to bring into account basically the environment in which you are projecting the, the sound. Um, then on the bottom right, we see uh, uh, an example of a design registration. I think a very similar one was in the presentation from Torsten. Right? So they have 3D glasses. They have, of course, their uh, trademark portfolio, which we already saw before. And then on the next slide, this is an excerpt from the uh, 10K form that was submitted recently by Dolby a Labs relating to fiscal year ended September 2022. So it's quite recent. Such a form is annually filed in the US 
um, and typically contains much more details than you would see normally in an annual report. And here we read, uh, we also seek to maintain select IP as trade <laughs> Uh, so there is an indication they do use uh, trade secrets, of course, and they, they talk on a bit further about the risks attached to uh, adopting their uh, trade secret strategy. And so there might be leakages, um, of course, if you adopt this strategy. But uh, just to illustrate that Dolby is also uh, using the strategy of IP trade secrets. I, I hope this gave a bit of an impression of the relevant IP rights used to support the IP strategy. And then we will move on to question number three, which will be presented by John. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening from uh, Osaka, Japan. I will be uh, presenting uh, which company uh, use uh, same technologies as uh, Dolby, and uh, as Faten suggested, uh, we are very generous. We mm. will introduce two companies. First is Qualcomm, and the second is IBM. Now, uh, for Qualcomm, um, they have a very extensive patent portfolio. As of September 2021, uh, they have about 140,000 patent and patent applications. Uh, which will be for, of course, wireless communication and uh, semiconductors. Uh, by the way, I would like to introduce Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm is a semicon and telco equipment company. It is a supplier of wireless communication products and services, uh, which will be used for processors, for mobile devices, and modem, which, of course, will be in turn uh, used by smartphones, tablets, and laptops. Second, they have a very, they have a standard essential uh, patents. Uh, Qualcomm owns a substantial number of SEPs, which are patents essential to industry standards such as uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G. Uh, these SEPs enable Qualcomm to play a vital role in shaping the development and implementation of wireless communication standards globally. Uh, they are, of course, also into licensing and royalties. Qualcomm's IP strategy includes licensing its patent Te patented technologies for other companies uh, in the industry. The company has pursued a licensing model based on percentage of the device's selling price. For example, if the SRP is, uh, say, $100, US $5% goes to Qualcomm, known as the Qualcomm licensing model. This approach has been a significant revenue for Qualcomm. It is also engaged in fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory obligation, or otherwise known as FRAND. As a holder of the uh, uh, SEPs, Qualcomm has committed to licensing its patents on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms to ensure broad adoption of its technologies. Adhering to FRAND obligations is an essential element of Qualcomm's IP strategy. Uh, number five is global IP enforcement. Um, like uh, Dolby, Qualcomm has been active in protecting its IP rights worldwide through legal means. The company is engaged in litigation and pursued legal actions against companies it believes, uh, it believes have infringed its patents. This aggressive approach to IP enforcement has been a significant component of Qualcomm's strategy. Number six is technology licensing and collaboration. Apart from patent licensing, Qualcomm has engaged in technology licensing and collaboration agreements with other companies. These agreements uh, involve shared technologies and intellectual property to foster innovation and create new market opportunities. And last but not the least, the research and development of Qualcomm it has invested significantly in R&D activities to continually develop new technologies and strengthen its IP. Okay, uh, we use IBM also to compare with Dolby. As of December 2020, Dolby, uh, sorry, IBM has 120,000 active patent and patent applications. Uh, number two, it is also in engaged in open innovation. It is uh, collaborating with external partners. Uh, it has partnered uh, with Microsoft to, to develop uh, Windows phone devices. 
also it has uh, it is supporting startups to welcome ventures to gain access to new technologies and it is also in open source software projects like uh, development of android uh, operating system uh, ibm is uh, with that kind of activity as of today. And then uh, IBM is also into patent licensing and royalties as of uh, today. Uh, it has licensing agreements. Uh, it has royalties on products that incorporate its patent technology. Uh, a percentage of the sales price of the product goes to IBM. Like for example, again, uh, if the uh, SRP is 100 US dollars, a part of it, like 5% goes to IBM. And then it is also involved with patent sales. So IBM has also sold patents to the other uh, companies individually or in large portfolios. Sorry, number four. It has uh, strategic uh, patent filing uh, practices. It is focused on key technologies uh, like cloud computing, AI or artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, quantum computing as well. In quantum computing, it uses quantum bits or qubits, uh, which is not visible on classical computers. Uh, it is also into joint patent filing to share the cost, like uh, uh, sharing the cost with Sony, Samsung, and Google on various technologies. IBM is also in defensive patenting, uh, piling patents that cover technologies that are relevant to its business, even if IBM has no plans to use these technologies in its own products. Uh, by doing so, IBM can, can deter competitors from suing them for patent infringement as IBM can counter sue with its own patents if uh, necessary. And uh, it is also engaged, IBM is also engaged in uh, patent pledges uh, for open source projects to promote innovation in emerging technologies. Uh, one of uh, IBM patent pledge is called IBM Patent Pledge for Open Source. Uh, it is committed not to assert its patents against open source software projects, except in cases of defensive litigation. So this means that developers and users of open source softwares can use IBM's patented technologies without fear, without fear of being sued for patent infringement, as long as they are not used in a way that infringes on IBM's other patents. So in 2019, IBM pledges related to development of AI technologies. And uh, lastly, uh, IBM is also engaged in IP licensing like uh, Dolby. Example is uh, IBM patent licensing program uh, for cloud computing, AI, and blockchain. So example of, and then example of technology transfer in addition to licensing. Uh, IBM is, uh, having a is having a program called IBM Research Lab with University of uh, Michigan. Uh, that's all for my part. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, John. So I'll put um, the uh, comparison and contrast of the three companies uh, in very simple and holistic terms. So basically, we look at the similarities. So all three of them um, license the IP to generate revenues and foster innovation. So for Adobe Labs, license audio and video technologies. Um, Qualcomm focuses on uh, wireless technologies and IBM uh, related to software patents. And they also emphasize IP protection through various different legal means, whether they are patents, uh, copyright, trademark, trade secret, so on. And uh, definitely Adobe Lab protect uh, audio code, uh, codecs and algorithm. Qualcomm is uh, related to the mobile processing and uh, system on chip products using smartphones and mobile devices and IBM secure software codes and confidential processes. And they, they, they all collaborate with international standard bodies. So Adobe Labs, they definitely contribute to the IEC, which deals with standards related to um, electronics um, and electrical products, and as well as uh, SMPT, so for, for the audio and video standards. So Qualcomm engages with the 3GPP, so that's the telecom and wireless communication standards. 
whereas IBM participates with the W3C for web-related uh, technology standards. And they also focus on capturing value from existing innovation. So for Adobe Labs, they're continuing to develop uh, new audiovisual technologies. Qualcomm try to monetize this wireless technology patent through licensing, and IBM offers software-related patent licensing and so on. And they also adopt very adaptive uh, with their IP strategies to the changing needs. So Adobe really tried to expand IP portfolio to imaging, video, and voice communication. Qualcomm tried to extend IP strategy to include semiconductor, AI, and IoT. And as well as IBM tried to adjust this IP strategy with focus on software and cloud services. Okay, let's go to the differences. So, so these are the differences. Um, so basically, Adobe really look at uh, licensing technology to consumer electronics content creators, service providers, whereas Qualcomm is more focused on um, uh, the licensing model based on the number of devices sold using its technology and charging percentage of the selling price of each device. Whereas uh, IBM has been licensing for over hundred years now and developed comprehensive IP strategy, including patent licensing and cross licensing and so on. Uh, Adobe tried to develop creative uh, IP strategy to support it's uh, various different uh, business models. So instead of being confined to a single industry and sector, so it tried to um, engage various consumer electronics manufacturers, content creators, and service providers, and so on. Whereas Qualcomm is more primarily focused on the wireless technology patent to smartphone um, manufacturers. And IBM has a wide range of uh, industries, uh, including healthcare, finances, and transportation, and so on. So in summary, Adobe focuses on technology licensing with unique IP strategies. Qualcomm primarily uh, target the wireless technology patents for smartphone, and IBM adopts quite comprehensive IP strategy with broad industry focus in various different sectors. So that's the uh, key differences. Okay, let's go to uh, Luca. Uh, um, here are some uh recommendation to Dolby, even if the recommendation may sound a little bit pompous as well as uh, due to Dolby is very successful, but looking at especially the comparison we have seen, uh, of course, Dolby can evaluate uh, alternative licensing models and uh, expand his uh, industry's focus. I think very, it does uh, something very well, but it may also try to do something else and also can uh, evaluate uh, a, a wider approach to uh, cross-licensing, as mentioned, in different sectors. And last slide is, um, next one, please, try to match uh, mm -hmm. what we have said before with uh, patent portfolio, but just give as number, as trend, as characteristics uh, to understand a little bit more on uh, uh, how these translate and the, if there are problems. Uh, um, we see that, for example, Dolby seems to have a kind of a bipolar management as the patent portfolio is uh, concentrated in basically two entities. 71% uh, uh, is in Dolby Live uh, Licensing Corporation and 26% in Dolby International. So it seems that they have a kind of bifurcated, one of them is uh, dealing with the asset management and likely the one is trying to end as protection centers. And uh, of course, they are not totally separated. They need to talk to each other, to transfer to each, uh, between each other. They may also bring some transactional costs. For example, in the 80s, there was a, a litigation by Dolby, which involved 10 patents. Some of them were from Dolby Lab uh, licensing. So some of them, uh, three, two of them were for international. One of them was licensed to them from Verizon. And these, of course, needs uh, and involves, as I mentioned, some transactional cost or at least a good coordination because, as uh, uh, Avocato Petrucci said, that one of the worst things uh, that you can do is to try to assert a patent, but you are not the correct right folder. And um, a certain number of uh, uh, Dolby patents, these uh, are flagged as a standard efficiency patents. So they deal with, with this. 
uh, one about 1.5% uh, of the portfolio, which is significant, but especially if we compare with Qualcomm, either as no, uh, total number, of course, Qual Qualcomm has a much wider portfolio. So number of SEP patents is higher, but the percentage is really high. 7% of the portfolio as tagged as standard essential patents. Uh, um, differently from Dolby, Qualcomm is uh, basically concentrates all their IP, at least patents asset into uh, a central holding with uh, just uh, um, about 1.5% uh, specialized on MEMS are on a separate entity. So they have decided to deal with this uh, technology separately, of course, again, with likely coordination in case of need or switching uh, ownership uh, and whatever. IBM, uh, look in the portfolio, it reflects exactly what uh, John and Guy said before. They are engaged in a lot of collaborations. 80% uh, of the patent portfolio is on a central holding, but they have a, a lot of fragmented co-ownership or some portfolio was switched between IBM and Google. Quite interesting for, for um, the second uh, uh, holding uh, of the patents is uh, Global Foundries with 4.5%. And quite interest, interestingly, and it's a risk with, with having all this co uh, collaboration like in April of this year, there has been um, starting a litigation from trade secret misappropriation, global foundries versus IBM for an alleged trade secret transfer to Rapidus. And this is going to be a mess. Uh, quite interesting, this is not involved in patents because probably patents has been very well regulated. They are in the most uh, tangible of the intangible assets, while this is uh, on trade secrets. So it's going to be quite... Uh, um, a mess, uh, and uh, that's uh, again collected with the agency theories, uh, asymmetry of information and expectation, because probably global funders wanted to have a kind of exclusivity in the collaboration. And this, uh, when they found that this did not happen, they sued, and it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen with this litigation, and especially with this uh, huge amount of patents. Um, that's it.